Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the last day of Zurich Hack. Um, but no worries, we still have plenty of content today. Uh, we have two talks. We have the advanced and beginner track running today. And we have a mob programming session where we're going to put together Space Invaders. So that's also going to be a lot of fun. Let's start with the first talk now by Simon Meyer and Ognia and Marek. Uh, Simon was actually one of the founding members of uh, the Zurich Hack community. Um, and also the main organizer of Zurich Hack for a few years. Ognian is his colleague at Digital Asset, and together they work on distributed protocols and smart contracts. If you have any questions during the talk, you can ask them in the talk discussion channel on our Discord. You have the word, Simon. Hey, hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here, and thanks a lot for the kind introduction, Jasper. Now, I just pasted actually on the talk discussion channel the slides, a PDF version, so you can follow along if you'd like to. And first, I want to give you just a bit of, of overview here. Like, I mean, it's a pretty ambitious question that we're focusing on here. Like, can Haskell be the world's database? And really, what this question is about, this is sort of the question we pursue in the demo project, or as I also sometimes like to call it, the demo adventure. And it's there's quite a few people working on this, um, quite a few members of the Haskell community, some outside. Um, and it's been about going on for about five years. And for a long time, essentially, we had the kernel of an idea, but sort of needed to mature further. It wasn't ready to be talked about. And likewise, actually, the code for it was uh, either not as mature or it was proprietary. But this really has changed now. Um, we're now at a point where ideas are, are mature, um, they really, there's, there's meat on them. And the code's open sourced. Uh, I've put a link at the bottom of the slides here. And that's why it's, it's a real pleasure to be given this chance to talk together with Ognin uh, about this, these ideas and this code here at Suri Hack, which really has a very dear place in my heart. Now, to motivate this a bit further, like why should we care about this question? Like, can Haskell be the world's database? Ognian, why don't you take it from here and give a bit of background? Hey, thank you very much, Simon. Um, thank you also, Jasper, and all the other organizers for inviting us. Um, yeah, so right now I'm sharing my screen. I actually don't really see your faces, so um, please yell. Or actually, Jasper is going to, like he said, he's going to um, pass on any questions that you might have. OK, so uh, yeah, it is a pretty ambitious question, right? Can Haskell be the world's database? And um, as always, a good way um, to get out of this is to just start ranting on a completely unrelated yet controversial topic. So I'll start talking about microservices, um, good or bad. And if you don't know what microservices are, it's this idea that you can architect your applications in such a way that essentially uh, you split the application up into small components that you then um, deploy and implement independently or as independently if, as possible of each other. And um, there's been a lot of you know heated discussion about these things. So if we want to say if, if it's good or bad, why don't we ask something like Hacker News? So here's a search for microservices and their antithesis, which is the monolith. Um, and if you sort of run the sentiment analysis on these things, where you're going to see all kinds of sentiments from excitement that Google and IBM are supporting microservices to um, titles such as enough with the microservices. Um, so what, what are these pros and cons? Why do people get up in the arms about it? Um, so sort of Netflix was the champion of microservices and they had great success with them. So obviously if Netflix is using them, then so should you. Um, but there, there are actually you know, very real advantages to this. One big one is that teams can do their things independently. So you get organizational efficiency. Then if one of these services goes down, the rest of your system can hopefully still keep running. So you get more robustness. And you also get scalability. If you have a scaling bottleneck in your system, um, you can just spin up more instances of the particular service that is the bottleneck. OK, so those are the pro pros. What are the cons? Uh, so to give you the cons, I'm going to um, actually give you an example that has been inspired. Uh, this has been inspired by one of the most 
distressing experiences of the year 2020 so far. And that's that there are no free Zurich Hack t-shirts this year. So something like this. Like if you, um, I guess many people who are now listening in don't actually, or haven't been to in the physical editions of Zurich Hack, but typically you get out free t-shirts and this is not the case this year, but you can still order them in, in the shop. So uh, let's say that you're something like your Zurich Hack, for instance, or the Zurich Friends of Haskell, and you want to order t-shirts. So you send your order to some t-shirt company and if the t-shirt company is um, using microservices, they might structure their system in this way, where there's some kind of order gateway, takes orders in, and then has microservices that are going to look, for instance, for or the deal with customers. So uh, this microservice might look at um, whether Zurich Friends of Haskell are maybe a repeat customer, maybe they get some kind of bonuses and so on. Um, then they look, they might have another service where, which is uh, deals with stock and you look whether you have enough stock and then um, you might do some billing and prepare things for delivery and so on. So what is the problem with microservices in, in such a setting? I mean, there are many ways to get microservices wrong, but one of the consistently hard problems is actually consistency, um, particularly consistency of distributed state. So this means, let me use my pointer here. So you have these various bits of states that are spread around and you need to keep them in a consistent state. So what this means, for example, is that um, the t-shirt company probably doesn't want to send a thousand t-shirts to the Zurich Friends of Haskell before they have built them for this. Now, what gets really hard with microservices, consistency is already hard, but what makes it even harder are failures. Um, and once you go to microservices, you are effectively using a distributed system. So your individual links can fail and nodes of your system can fail. And then you have to cope with them and this brings a lot of complexity. So you might have to program some retries in. Um, you have to be careful not to overload the system, for instance, while doing these retries. You might need to orchestrate your services very carefully. And what you will very typically end up doing is you're going to end up rolling your own transactions. And this is pretty hard, especially in the distributed setting. So the question is now, well, what can you do? Uh, one thing you can do is you can sort of give up on the microservice approach and you just move back to um, something like a monolith. So usually you're running, you're running everything on the same node and maybe in the same process. And typically you have a database um, that keeps all of your data and that helps a lot with all of your consistency problems because, well, the databases are sort of made for that. So in this way, you sort of get rid of um, all the advantages and disadvantages. And you know this might work for you well enough. Maybe you can also just make part of your system as, as a monolith, the part that, that really needs um, strong consistency and, and turn the rest into microservices. However, this can still break down. And in particular, it breaks down if you need to talk to external systems. Um, so for instance, if the t-shirt company is also ordering stickers from the sticker company and some textile from a textile company, the systems of the t-shirt company, regardless of whether they're implemented as microservices or monoliths, um, they will have to talk to, to these other external systems. And now you have, again, problems with consistency of state. Um, just now the state is actually distributed among different organizations. And uh, same as in the microservice or in the internal service example, you will have to cope with failures. So these again make everything even more complicated. So now you have a heap of issues again to deal with. So you have to deal with things like security in addition to um, internal microservices because you're now going sort of outside of trust boundaries, which are here shown here in the image with these dashed lines. You again very likely need to roll your own transactions. Now this is typically so complicated across organizations that you just accept to live with inconsistencies and then um, often you have to do reconciliation. So this can arise either um, due to inconsistencies or to different computational um, processes. What I mean is, for instance, the sticker company might just um, have a billing system that looks at all the orders that the t-shirt company has made within the month of, let's say, May. And then at the end of the month, they run some kind of a procedure and they come up with a number and they send it to the t-shirt company. And on the other hand, the t-shirt company might do the same thing. 
run their own numbers and then you come up with two numbers and you have to decide which one of these is, is correct. So this is often quite a manual process. And the question now is, well, is there a way out of this problem? And um, the one idea that I think Simon and I really want to plant in your heads with this talk is what if we architected our applications differently? In particular, what if we had something like a virtual world database that would hold all of this data and take care essentially of all of these problems that you have seen uh, that I've shown um, previously. So this would maintain consistency in some way for you. And uh, now obviously I say a virtual world database because clearly there cannot be one physical machine that is going to store all of your data. Um, that, that's just not going to work. So, okay, hopefully sounds interesting. Um, you're probably wondering how would you, what, what would this even be like? How would you implement this? So to get some insight into this, that question, um, why don't we just look at what we need for, for a world database? So as for any database, what you need is something like, uh, what you need is some form of a data model first. So um, for example, in relational databases, you use relations as your data model, and then you have operations on this data which are expressed through either relational calculus or relational algebra or something more human friendly such as SQL. So we need some kind of a data model. Once we have a data model, then we need to implement it. And clearly this implementation needs to be scalable. Now remember, we want to make a world database so it better be scalable. Obviously it also needs to be secure intuitively in some ways because you're going to be dealing with data that belongs to many different organizations, individuals, and so on. And a related notion is that we want to have uh, privacy and confidentiality because some data might be confidential that you want to put in your uh, database. And all of these entities that are going to take part in the world database, well, they operate in different countries probably, so you have to be able to provide some kinds of regulatory compliance means um, one example of what you need to do for regulatory compliance that's pretty prominent is uh, data deletion, for instance, for the right to forget in the GDPR regulation if you're handling data of customers from the European Union. And there is one other very necessary ingredient for a world database that is implicit in the name, and that is that there can be only one. Now, I don't mean by this that we should go around beheading each other. What I mean is that effectively this database, it has to be always extensible with new users. You have to be able to add new users. You have to be able to add new data. And you cannot end up in a situation when you have two sort of instances of this world database that you cannot connect to each other because in that case, neither of them is really the world database. Okay, so these are the necessary ingredients. And this is actually also, this also gives us actually the outline of the talk. Um, we will go through these things. So the data model and an implementation, the database engine. Then we'll briefly touch on privacy and regulatory compliance and then conclude. And all the while um, we will be talking about uh, requirements of what you really need to build such a system, what possible choices you might have. And then we will talk about the choices that we made in uh, DAML, our smart contract language, and it also is basically our world database. And with that, I will actually hand it off to Simon for the data model. Oh, what's happening here? Ah, all right, we're back on track. Um, how can you still hear me well? Uh, what I'd like to do now actually is, is get a bit back to Haskell um, and really look together with you at how could we design a data model that's that's really useful, expressive, and, and works well. So just switch to the right screen. Here we go. All right. One way to solve design questions is just look at how have they been solved in the past. And the first design question we need to solve is like, okay, what kind of structure will our data have? And if you look at prominent um, data formats, then we see SQL, JSON, Protobuf, GraphQL, 
they're all quite heavily used in the world. And there's clearly a trend going towards more type safety and more expressiveness. And I would posit that the reason behind this trend really is that human time is just much more expensive and valuable than machine time. So if we can do something to save on human time and um, pay some machine time for this, we're likely going to do that. Type safety, as you all know, helps us very well to um, catch errors early, so make the iteration loop faster and humans more productive. And likewise, expressiveness, it, it really uh, keeps humans from having to sort of explain to a computer in a very detailed language what they want. And we know a language, oh, sorry, there actually one, one other thing to say here is really that the ease of trade-off between ergonomics, which makes humans more effective, and performance, which makes essentially computers more effective. And as I said, the trend really is just let the computers do more work and gradually increase the performance there. And it's a language that really plays this game very well. It's a language you all know and love, and, and Haskell really is to the top right here. I mean, there are places more to the top right, uh, but it starts to get considerably, considerably more difficult to sort of use that industrial, industrially, at least at the current time. And that's the inspiration we took, actually. Well, um, what data format could we take here? Essentially, let's take the Haskell data types and remove the ones which you can't serialize. Because if you talk database, you really need to serialize that data. You need to ship it over the network. You need to store it on disk. Um, and concretely in DAML, sort of what you get is just algebraic data types, no functions, and no um, lazy fields. All right, now that we have a data structure chosen, we can take a step forward and say, how should our database state look like? And again, we solve it by looking at what have successful products done. I mean, SQL databases use a row-based relational view. Document databases use a document-based view. But at the core, they, they're the same. You have triples of identifiers for the rows and the value in the row, or documents and the um, document IDs and the documents. And that's what we choose here as well, so nothing surprising. A database states will just a map from row identifiers to rows. And we use here Haskell syntax and the Haskell type class actually to identify special properties we need from the data stored in there. For example, we want them to be serializable. I'm not going into detail here on um, how this serializability is implemented. I mean, there's lots of options in the Haskell ecosystem. All right, state is only one part. You, you now can represent your current state. You now want to see how it evolves. And before we go there, sorry for jumping ahead. Uh, let's make an example. Commonly, what you'd know is that um, a T-shirt company, for example, would probably maintain a database with a table of bills or invoices. And because Surihack um, does is a good customer for buying T-shirts, and the Zurich friends of Haskell are, are a good customer, actually, um, we might have an entry like this where on row ID 2 uh, for 500 US dollars, actually 500 Surihack T's have been um, bought by the Zurich Friends of Haskell. Pretty good price. We are a pretty good customer. So how do we translate this? Well, the translation is quite direct. Uh, we introduce a Haskell data type for bills, price, currency, description, customer, um, unsurprising the rows. The one thing that is a bit surprising here is that we actually inline the T-shirt company, so the issuer. And uh, the reason there is that this gets is what we have available. We have just this flat database state, just this map from row IDs to rows. So there's no table concept, but that's easy to build by just inlining sort of the, the table owner here. And it makes sense. A, a bill here really captures sort of this agreement between a customer and an issuer um, to pay in a certain currency for a particular object. We posit that bills are serializable. And with that, actually, this example definition, uh, this example value here down here becomes well defined. Row two is a bill over 500 US dollars for 500 Siri hack tees, uh, where which bought, were bought by the friends of Haskell and a t-shirt company um, is the seller. All right, now we're at that point. We have database state uh, and we can look at how do we change this database? And, and that's again, actually a pretty big design question. You, you need to choose a, a language that describes the changes or as I'm saying here, database updates. And one thing which you'd expect is that if, if you really want to have this 
one database to virtually serve as a backend for uh, all applications, then transactions should the transaction language needs to be expressive. And, and one choice we can make here with our Haskell background is that we just say, well, let's make this a monad and then look at what primitive operations we expose. And exposing primitive operations actually looks innocuous and you'd say, well, uh, let's just use the most expressive option. But actually that's not that easy a choice because the more expressive the primitive operations, the harder it is to implement this. And here actually what we choose is to go really light on the expressiveness. We access, we provide row-wise access only um, because that makes implementation easy. So concretely what we have is an operation create for creating a new row for a value that is serializable. And you get back the row ID. You have an operation fetch, which is reading a row that is known. And actually fetch will fail if that row, row doesn't exist. That again is actually a conscious choice because verifying non-existence of a data item at a global scale is really difficult. And then unsurprisingly, rows can be deleted. Moreover, transactions can fail. Here I'm positing an operation assert that just fails if the boolean here is false. All right, Simon, we have a clarification question about the previous slide, if you can go back for just one second. Yeah, sure. Um, so the question is why the example here is a, is a tuple. Um, uh, the example the is a tuple because um, of the database state here. It's, the example is a row of type bill. So it's a row. And so I did here a bit of sort of mental gymnastic, put in um, this row ID, which here was inlined as, as, a, as a column itself. So, so actually, that's a very good question. I think I, I should have changed this to sort of use more something like a PostgreSQL representation where every row of a table actually has a particular ID, the object ID, which is outside the table schema. Thanks, that's actually a very good question. Um, I hope that clarifies it. Ah, good, just saw the message. Thank you, Fabul. All right, um, it's just explaining database update language. And before I can give an exp example here, um, I need to tie this a bit more uh, to the real world. And, and here I'm just positing a tie. So let's assume actually there is an implementation of that world database and, and we'll, we'll actually go there. Um, if you were to program against this, probably one expectation is that you have some type for representing this database handles. And then this function run update uh, can be seen as a function that takes the database handle and the party that submits the update an update expression, which really de describes the change, and then uses database handle to ship that transaction, execute it in the right way, and ultimately computes the result or throws an exception. I'm using here exceptions because that is actually was a bit lighter on typing. Um, to give you one example of an exception that could happen is that the update actually refers to a row that doesn't exist. There are more exceptions, and, and this is one thing that, that is sort of gradually unfolds uh, the more you go into an implementation. So with that, we can actually make this um, a very concrete example and say, all right, one thing that might happen actually is that the Zurich Friends of Haskell don't go for the cheap $1 t-shirts. They actually really like to sell, um, sell quality or order quality. So they pay 20 bucks. I think that's the correct multiplication. Yes, I believe so. 20 bucks per t-shirt and pay $10,000 actually for 500 Surrey hack tees. And as part of that, uh, the t-shirt company would actually run this update on the world database, backing this sort of workflow and create such a bill. We might expect this to succeed, but we might also think one step further and say, well, actually we had this notion that a bill should really represent sort of a, a binding agreement uh, that between the customer and the t-shirt company that really the customer must pay. And if it's a binding agreement, then actually we wouldn't want the t-shirt company to just be able to create that. Well, we would like to have more evidence essentially in our database. And that's actually what we would like this work database to do because really authorization is key. What we want to have is sort of shared data, but separate control. And we wouldn't want this bill to be able to be created directly. So we would like to the world database to raise a 
missing authorization exception here saying, hey, um, Zurich Friends of Haskell didn't agree to this. But if you have that then, yeah, and so how, how can I do that? And the concept here, then this again is a design choice, is that you say, well, it probably makes sense to have a concept of data owners. And we can encode that very directly, or you introduce a class has owners, um, which for a type tells the list of parties which own that. And for a bill, we would expect the owners to be both the customer and the issue. And then actually we can modify this create operation such that it also takes the owners or has owners constraint and enforces the authorization rule, which is that, well, in the context where this update runs, the owners must agree. They must be authorizing this update. And you saw before in the example that run update actually takes the submitter. And that submitter is actually sort of the authorizers for that primary update. So that's why we would expect that previous operation here to fail. Because the submitter is just a t-shirt company. The data owners are Zurich Friends of Haskell and the t-shirt company. So obviously Zurich Friends of Haskell is not authorizing this. But if you go there, we have a problem. There's something missing here. Because how can we then create rows with more than one data owner. And that's where another important thought comes in. And I've, I've been referring to the sort of this legal background um, as, as a source of inspiration. And there it is actually such in legal systems, contracts don't just come into existence directly. There's actually an offer for a contract. And once the offeree signs it and accepts it thereby, there's actually a binding contract between two parties. And you have more of these chains if you have multi-party contracts. And if you think about ordering t-shirts, actually, that's the workflow that happens as well. It's quite well hidden in the web applications. I mean, you click together your order, and then you essentially get a quote. And only once you really click pay now or buy now, uh, this quote or offer gets converted into actually an obligation to pay and into an obligation for the t-shirt company to deliver. So how can we encode this? We introduce a type for quotes, same fields because that's what we're quoting, it's realizable as well. But the owners of the quote is just the issuer because it's the only one that's bound. Like if there's an acceptance, the issuer needs to deliver. And with that, we can create this quote. And the authorization rule on creates actually goes through because Zurich Friends of Haskell is no longer an owner. So that succeeds. And now we get to this question, well, awesome. We have a quote, we have its ID. How can Zurich Friends of Haskell accept this? And that's where sort of the encoding becomes a bit more complicated. Uh, but bear with me. We're going to zoom out after this right away and actually get to a more convenient syntax. We can encode store procedures. Um, and perhaps before I go there, one, one clarification. Like one, one mental example that we can make here is that we say, well, could Zurich Friends of Haskell just delete the quote um, on as, at the point where they buy it and create a bill? But then we have the reverse problem again. Zurich Friends of Haskell can't just create a bill, uh, which is also owned by the T-shirt company. So the T-shirt company really wants to have a bit of control what Zurich Friends of Haskell can do. And they can provide that control with store procedures. So how do we assign store procedures to data types? Well, we use a multi-parameter type class. Um, so procedure P is a procedure for the row of value T. And the procedure returns a result of type R. And then for these procedures, there's two things which need to be um, explained. One, who controls calling this procedure? And that just is given both the row value and the procedure and needs to return a party. And then, well, if that caller decides to call it, what is the update to the database that should happen if that procedure is called? And with that, we can have this authorization rule is that in the body of this update, both the controller and the data owners authorize actions. And that's what allows us actually to now fully go through with our example. We can introduce a data type accept to just represent that a call to the accept procedure, make it a procedure for a quote, controller for quote, and here I'm using record wildcards, is just the customer. So the, that customer value here is, is a bound here in that wildcard the field customer of the quote. And um, on acceptance, the bill is created. 
So the example then becomes that we run the same update by the t-shirt company that gives a quote, and that quote then is accepted in that second step by Zurich Friends of Haskell by ex uh, running an update, which is to call on that quote ID the accept choice. And here's something quite magical happening. is like essentially here the t-shirt company is pre-approving the creation of the bill in the body of this call with the data owner Zurich Friends of Haskell and the t-shirt company. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if you, if you don't get it right away here, but this, this really actually matches well with how contractual workflows work in our legal systems. So that's why actually it works well to represent these in sort of your database or IT infrastructure. One thing that really helps to get to take another grasp is, is if you actually have a custom syntax. And what DAML is really, DAML is just GHC Haskell as from a syntactic perspective with a record dot proposal, which we, we pushed, a record with proposal to again make record, working with records more convenient, and then this template syntax that I'm showing here. I'm gonna run now top down through the template syntax itself. So a here, this template quote declares this quote data type with these fields. And then it declares also these type class instances with some syntactic sugar. We use the keyword signatory for data owners. Um, the idea here is these are the people that sign the contract that's been created and this is a contract template. Um, we can also actually add something which we haven't, I haven't talked about yet, but will um, add further read-only access to this data. Here, for example, we add read-only access for the customer because that makes sense, like the customer should see a quote that's created so that he can actually accept it. And the store procedures sort of they combine this definition of who controls it, so the controller customer, can call the accept procedure and the body then really is that update expression and here the body is also a bit extended with both creating an order for actually the delivery that represents the delivery obligation that the t-shirt company enters into and the bill which represents essentially a payment obligation that the customer enters into and that's it the background behind this this gets t sugared exactly using these type classes um, and there's, there's no real magic uh, behind that. The other thing we did is actually we built uh, on top of the IDE ecosystem a few years ago, uh, the DAML ID um, on Visual Studio Code, and then later actually factored a good chunk of our code out into GHC ID, uh, which is now luckily seeing a lot of use. And we just take that GHC ID and extend it with a few rules around. I'm not gonna go into the compiler details here, uh, but Martin Huschenbett in who leads the language engineering team has a good talk on this, which I reference from here. The other thing actually is that for, yeah, in the beginning really, we believe this is mostly a language problem, a language engineering problem, but we learned the hard way that this really is a system engineering and a software ecosystem engineering problem. Um, and I'm giving here an overview over the tool stack that, that we now provide to just give you a feel for how all of this relates. Yes, you use the language to define the contract code that governs how the data, what data is stored and how it evolves. And then there's an important thing to know is that really this data is not maintained by a single database. It's multiple nodes, separate processes that are connected through some commit protocol or, or some um, shared infrastructure. This kind of structure here, is what we call a distributed ledger. And in contrast to a distributed database, it is such that it's not only that the processes, that there are separate processes storing the data and that they need to be sort of acting in a consistent fashion, that's the distributed database problem. In the distributed ledger problem, you also have it that these nodes are run by different entities that don't mutually trust each other. That's, that's the complication that's being added. But you can still use a lot of database technology. Now, if you have one node, then essentially that's a database access for a specific entity. And for that entity actually get value from that database, it needs to provide an end user interface. And that's where we provide a React UI framework, a JSON API backing it, which then sort of interacts with the database and makes that more convenient. There's a REPL for debugging, and there's an automation framework, which again is sort of using the DAML uh, syntax to write automation to automatically accept, for example, quotes in case that is warranted. So what you see here is actually that we are in a distributed system setting, and that has a few sort of special implications on 
the runtime of, of the language. That's where we actually deviate from Haskell. And the special requirements are that, one, this open world that you have in Type Plus is actually not the, the right setup here, because uh, you really want to know when you enter, sort of when you create a data item that you own, what procedures associated, which means what kind of um, follow-ups can happen to this data. So these store procedures that are actually declared with these templates, they are in a closed uh, world. Then the procedure execution actually must be verifiable by data owners. I mean, what you see here is that one um, node might submit a change to database, but that change might affect other nodes. Uh, we'll get more on that later in Ogmian's part. And, and for this, we really need both mobile code um, and we need actually deterministic execution. Otherwise, this system goes out of sync very quickly. And that's also, that was a big inspiration why we want to have a purely functional language at, at its core. Then last but not least, all addressing that we do, both for code and types must be globally unique because otherwise we wouldn't have extensibility. There's only one virtual world database, but we want to be able to add more and more workflows, data items, tables, and essentially after once we go. So for DAML, what we do is actually we ship the code and types together in a compiled package, um, which uses a strict purely functional core. That's actually also typed. And that allows us to address code as function at package hash. It's not surprising, it's a very direct choice. And to address types as type at package hash. And the world database then really becomes just a map from row IDs to tuples where we say it's this type at this package, and these are the bytes of the value um, of that type. And here you can see that can be a huge map and you can actually make that scale. Now, the other thing I didn't talk about, and I have seen flowing by some questions about privacy, is read authorization. If you have only one database, like, okay, who can read it? And that, that's a really important point. I mean, in business, many transactions, much data is actually private. Here's sort of a bit of a silly example, like let's assume we have a health friend of low code um, that want to sort of get better deals than Zurich Friends of Haskell and they just scan the bills of what Zurich Friends of Haskell got and push the T-shirt company into getting a better deal there. Um, but yeah, that's a silly example, but really pricing data, I think you should always consider that private. And in DAML, the choice that we do is really that we go for data minimization. We say, well, we definitely need data be visible to owners. They sort of can be even bound by that data. And then these owners can also decide to add explicitly listed observers. And to make this more concrete, so one example that could happen is that actually this sort of t-shirts table has both um, a row for the health friend of low code, which actually got a better deal, um, and the row for the Zurich friends of Haskell. And the visibility is then such that we just have row-based access control. Health friends can see their row, Zurich friends can see their row, and the t-shirt company can see both rows. And this is how we partition state or manage visibility on the state. Um, sorry, I wanted to go one step further. But there's one, one other thing to say here. The, the other thing which one has to decide is like, uh, how many queries to allow. And here we actually, again, make a choice. We actually just ban wide queries on the work database. We only allow pointwise access and sort of our tooling provides um, streaming update notifications. And the reason for this is both a scalability reason, but also reason actually on how we construct transactions visibility in there. So let's, let's go through the transaction structure. What, what we do there is actually we capture transactions just as the call tree of these store procedures. So here you see the call tree with visibility annotations for the accept offer choice can be seen by Zurich Friends of Haskell and the T-shirt company, and both the bill and the order below are seen by both of these. And this is nice, um, this call tree is compositional. And if you have a use case where actually we script a bit more and we have a, um, a store procedure to actually get the T-shirts both paid and delivered, then there might be another sub-transaction where the T-shirt company uses a contract they have with the delivery company to accept that offer for the, by the delivery company and create a concrete delivery order for these T-shirts and the delivery bill. 
And here the visibility changes. It's only these are only no nodes and contracts known to T-shirt company and delivery company. Now, for the full transaction, we need to look at how do we extend read visibility. And one choice that we do actually is that Zurich so Friends of Haskell is interested in knowing that the whole transaction below here has been executed correctly. So we make this subtree visible to them. But importantly, we only make subtrees visible and not sort of the full transactions. And for example, that means that the delivery company doesn't see this left tree here. And that's actually good because the delivery company might be a customer of the t-shirt company as well. And the t-shirt company might not want to tell them what kind of prices they give to other customers. And here you also see, like, if, if you were to allow general queries, it would be very difficult to build such a privacy model. So that's one reason why we ban it. And as you'll see later also, actually, general queries, um, they make scalability really hard. But with that, we have actually now sort of a conceptual data model together. I, I know this is quite a mouthful, but I hope sort of you get an intuition for it. Here, just a quick recap. As data structures, we choose algebraic data types with these ownership and read access annotations. As write operations, all writes happen via store procedures, whose code is just in a purely functional core language, um, extended with authorization logic, and insert and delete operations to change that oper uh, to change the database actually in a transactional fashion. Read operations are pointwise, and um, on the edge of the database, one gets insert and delete notifications. And the transactions are hierarchical with this third-party visibility. And then the final world database state is really just this map from row IDs, probably bytes, to tuples of type at package hash and the value bytes. All right, so now we have a data model. The next step actually is to look at how could we bring that to, uh, to life? Is it, do you need a blockchain or not? That's probably a question some people have been asking. Ognen, why don't you explain? Thank you very much. Um, I'll also steal the screen from you and you get the nice okay so um yeah so that's the question so how do we bring it to life and the first thing that you probably are asking yourself or maybe should be asking yourself is um how to scale this so so will whatever we build can it scale because again we're trying to build a world database um so we really want to build essentially something that you can stuff all of the world's data into and if you remember the introduction, what we wanted to have is we want to have a consistent database because we wanted to get rid of all of these consistency problems. Um, and if you have a consistent database, now the typical ways to scale it is um, our first, um, you have to shard the database. So meaning that you have to split up the data into uh, partitions such that your transaction typically operate on only one or uh, perhaps a small number of these partitions. And well, that's about it actually. So um, sharding is, is really your, your best bet here. And now let's look at maybe our data and let's decide on how we can actually shard this. So uh, let's look at our bills table again that, that Simon was showing in the previous example and a look at uh, all the entries. So now I've kind of already hinted because I've hidden some of the columns, but I've hinted at a very natural way to shard our database. And this is to use this notion of data ownership that, that Simon has introduced to actually create partitions. So we can split this table up into logical partitions, for instance, one for the health friends of LOL code and the t-shirt company. And the first row of the table goes to uh, that partition, whereas the second row goes to the partition uh, that is shared between the Zurich Friends of Haskell and the T-shirt company. Now, these logical partitions, they are labeled by the set of the owners of, of the rows. Um, now, once you have the logical partitions, obviously, you will have also some kind of physical partitions. And the natural choice there seems to be to give each party its one single physical partition. So the health, health Friends of LOL code um, get a physical partition and so did the uh, Zero Friends of Haskell, and so does the T-shirt company. And this gives us already a way to partition our data. Now, this might not be quite enough. For instance, if the T-shirt company has a lot of orders, this partition might still not fin fit into a single node, but let's, let's start from there. Okay, so now we have partitions, 
And if you have partitions in a distributed database, what you need to be able to do is you need to commit transactions over it. So you need some kind of a commit protocol. So let's look at that next. Um, let's say that we are looking at this transaction, the example transaction that, that Simon's mentioned, where you are uh, the zero friends of Haskell want to buy some t-shirts and want to get them delivered. So you have these three physical partitions that are involved. You have the Zurich Friends of Haskell, you have the t-shirt company, and you have the delivery company. So how does the protocol look like? Uh, so to actually run the protocol, we're going to enlist the help of some additional entities. And these are going to be two additional systems. One is going to be a message queue effectively, and the other one is going to be a commit coordinator. And together, these form what we call a DAML canton. Now, the protocol is going to be quite similar to the two-phase commit protocol, if you're familiar with that, but there are some uh, kind of twists to it. So let's say that Zurich Friends of Haskell wants to actually get this transaction committed. So the first thing that they're going to do is they're just going to send a message to the message queue with the transaction. The message queue is going to order all messages and timestamp them in, in increasing order. It's going to forward the record of this transaction to the commit coordinator. And it's going to forward the messages to the um, recipients, so the physical partitions. So this actually makes up the prepare phase of, the, of our commit protocol. OK, now what happens next is that all of these physical partitions, they run some checks on the transaction. Now, the checks serve two purposes. The first one is concurrency control. So this gives you the consistency guarantees. And this is basically what any distributed database would, would also have. Um, and what we use here is actually make use of the fact that the message queue orders transactions and of the fact that we have deterministic transactions. So this makes it easier to process these things in a um, efficient manner. Now, the second part of the verifications actually is related to the fact that we are running our transactions across multiple partitions where partitions don't necessarily trust each other. So you have entities that don't really trust each other. So for instance, the Zurich Friends of Haskell might not completely trust the t-shirt company to do just whatever. So then they have um, some other checks that they do. And this is sort of something that, that is very um, characteristic of, of our system. Once they run these checks, they send the responses back through the message queue to the commit coordinator. The commit coordinator records the responses. And once it uh, gathers all the responses, it tells everybody whether to commit or to abort. So this is a very high level overview of the protocol. There are many, many details about it that I won't go into. One thing that I will mention though, is that the messages that are sent are, well, there are two things about it. First, it is not really a single message that is sent because if you remember earlier, we said that the t-shirt company, sorry, the delivery company does not need to see anything about this left side of the transaction, right? So the message that the Zurich Friends of Haskell is going to send to the delivery company, the delivery company is going to be different than the message that it sends to the t-shirt company because they see different parts of the transaction. Moreover, all of the messages that are going to be sent are actually encrypted such that whoever is running the message queue doesn't actually learn the contents of the messages. So the message queue doesn't learn the price, for instance. It, the message queue does learn who is involved, but not, not the details. So for further details, you can refer to canton.io. So I should just also say that this is our next generation commit protocol. And um, it's still in alpha stage, so you can definitely download and run it, but maybe don't you know don't trust your extremely valuable data to it just yet. Uh, maybe wait for a few months for that. Okay, um, so this is how we run a single transaction. But again, the big question is, will it scale? And you might be thinking, well, we have this message queue here, so do we really want to? actually send all the world's data through a single message queue. And yes, this would not scale. So what we do instead is we um, allow all of these physical partitions, so these nodes here, to actually connect to many cantons. Now recall a canton, it contains a message queue. 
And this is sort of an open system in the sense that you can always deploy a new Canton. Anybody can do that. And you can do it for whatever purpose you want. And deploying a new Canton can help you with scalability because you can process in parallel whatever happens on different Cantons. So both the nodes can process things in parallel and the Cantons themselves are obviously completely independent of each other. Yet while doing this, what we really want to maintain is this notion that there can be only one. So we still need to have something that's logically still the same shared world database. And the protocol allows you to do this. So it allows you to actually run joint transactions whenever you have a common Canton that all the partitions of the transaction, the physical partitions are connected to. And I think this is essentially really a requirement um, of the world database. I think you know you need to be sca scalable and you need to have only one. This is both of these things. I think you don't have a world database, you don't have them. Um, I'll briefly also just touch on the trust assumptions. So we have effectively two kinds of components. We have the nodes and the nodes are these physical partitions. These are completely untrusted. So they can try to do whatever they want and they should not be able to influence the other nodes in any bad way. On the other hand, the cantons themselves, they are assumed to be what's called honest but curious. So this means that they are curious so they can look at, look at all the data that they have and they can try to make as many inferences as they can about this data. So the message queue might try to learn as much as it can about the price, and we try to protect against that using primarily using encryption. But they're assumed to not interfere with the protocol um, in a direct fashion, so they're not going to change messages and things like that. So um, you might like the curious assumption, but you might think that the honest assumption is a bit too strong, not very realistic, but there are ways to mitigate that. So you can implement Cantons in different ways. What we have right now, um, what is publicly available is an implementation with a trusted third party that is effectively using a database as a message queue. But you can go uh, further and you can lower the trust requirements by replicating your system in a Byzantine fault tolerant way. This means that you run it, for instance, with you run a message queue with seven replicas and two of these replicas can misbehave and the system still works, it does not break. One typical place where you find such replicated Byzantine fault tolerant systems are most of the um, enterprise distributed ledgers. So for instance, we have a prototype that runs a Canton on the hyperledger fabric, though this is yet not yet um, publicly available, so it's it's still quite unstable. And even even this is not enough, then you can just go one step further and just move to a blockchain, for instance Ethereum, and actually use that as as a Canton. Okay, so um, that gives a quick overview of the implementation. I'll move to um, what I want to touch upon briefly are privacy and, and regulatory compliance. So you saw already that in Simon's part, so you already discussed this notion of read authorization. And this gives us confidentiality and privacy. And actually it gives us really the building block of, of what we are doing. But in general, you need more. Like we said, these physical partitions, they're going to be operating with data that, that is somehow under different jurisdictions and you will need to comply with all kinds of regulations like GDPR, um, probably everybody's heard about that, it's the, the data protection regulation. If you're dealing with data of European Union customers, you have to adhere to it. California has something similar with CCPA, uh, FINRA has similar requirements for financial data, there are requirements for health data and so on. And some of these requirements might look like you need to have, um, might look like data localizations, which means that you are legally required to physically store the data in a particular territory. So for instance, if you have health data of Australian citizens, Australia will ask you to store this data physically in Australia. Then you will have requirements such as data deletion, like the right to forget in GDPR. Now what's actually quite important here is something that I haven't really touched about, but in general with the world database, you want to have some kind of cryptographic evidence that things are correct. So uh, you need to have what's called non-repudiation and you need to be able to preserve this. 
Um, so in general, our, our protocol actually allows you to do this, but this is something that you really need to think about in general if you're uh, trying to build a world database. And in general, the goalpost of this whole thing is that you cannot really implement all the regulations in the database, but you need to be able to enable the users of the database to, to be compliant. And um, I think the principles that we took with basically minimizing uh, data and uh, where how data is used, the notions, notions of data ownership, these really help greatly with uh, such requirements. And this brings me um, towards the conclusion of the talk. I'll briefly first look at some remaining challenges and open questions. And uh, one challenge is something that Simon's already hinted at, and that's sort of this um, tension between expressiveness of your language and, and privacy. So um, we have made some trade-offs. The question is, can these be improved? I think it's still an open question to find the best kind of, you know, best trade-offs there. You're probably looking at some sort of Pareto line there. Performance is always a question. We're really, we've designed the system with performance in mind, but we're uh, really only looking right now at how hard you can push the individual components of it. Um, the choice of your stored procedure language or smart contract language, if you want to look at it that way, it, this is also another question that you have to decide on. Uh, we chose Haskell. We think well, it's a great language. Um, it gives us many benefits, such as the deterministic execution, at least uh, for, there's, it's easy to delineate the subset of Haskell that is deterministic. But um, there are some trade-offs. So, you know, size of the community, um, how many libraries you have, available, things like that. And related to that, you have to deal with network effects if you're looking at something like this, because really to get the most benefit, you really want to have the world database. So you need to have as much data in there as possible. Um, and this requires network effects. On the implementation side, one interesting challenge is <clears throat> the liveness of the commit protocol. Um, so effectively, when are you able to um, commit transactions to the protocol? And we're looking at <clears throat> various way of improving this. Okay, so these are some challenges, but I think um, we have been able to overcome many of these. Um, we have already a range of industrial applications of this technology. I won't really go into details, but um, I'll present some companies. So most of these come from either the financial world, such as the um, Australian Stock Exchange um, or the ISTA, uh, Hong Kong exchange. And this is actually, they, in the financial industry, one typical problem that you have is this problem of reconciliation. You run some numbers on one side, you run some numbers on the other side, you come up with two different numbers and you have to decide which one is correct. So something like a world database is extremely helpful there. And the other um, kind of area that we're there's a lot of demand for this. Is something like healthcare, especially if you have uh, sensitive data. So, sorry, the approach with um, data ownership and so on. This is something that that uh, really makes sense in in those cases. Uh, in addition to these industrial commercial projects that we have, we've also been doing uh, open source projects. Uh, so we have, for instance, an implementation of a Kanban board. Um, a chat application, a vacation tracker, a distributed marketplace. Uh, we also have a chess application, which gives you very strong guarantees that you cannot repudiate losing a game. Um, we also have a Twitter clone, um, which comes as, a, as a, an example application. And actually, we're quite excited to see um, what you folks can do with something like this. So uh, we'll be hanging out at, at the uh, Zero hack channels uh, had uh, chat channels later, and uh, yeah, um, if you have ideas, we'll be glad to hear. So you can host all of these um, on Project Dabble. So this is for, at the moment it's free hosting. So if you want to deploy your application, it's also a good way to do that. Okay, and uh, now actually, as uh, Simon and I were preparing this talk, we were giving it to some colleagues in the company and we were ended up sort of, uh, you know, having this example of t-shirts and fretting for the lack of free t-shirts at, at Zurihack this year. Um, so we decided to actually kind of entice people to experiment with uh, with DAML and, and our protocol Canton uh, over the weekend. So if you're looking for something to do, um, look at contracts for t-shirts um, at this channel. So 
um, we are running sort of a competition. We're giving out, I think, 20 um, zero hack t-shirts. So typically digital assets actually sponsors uh, zero hack, the physical editions. So we're going to sponsor uh, 20 t-shirts to get the t-shirt. Um, you'll have to toy and play around with the um, contracts uh, written in DAML. I can actually show you a little bit of what you will need to do. So uh, what you see here is, and I hope this is large enough for everybody's screens. Um, here I actually have a local instance of this, a local node of the world database running here. And uh, I can use it to enter the contest. So there are readmes of how you need to, uh, what you need to do uh, to do this. But I'm going to um, run a brief demo here. So I'm going to add, a, a new party and this is now going to be actually so this is a very quick hack that we've done um, so this is not a very polished interface but I can actually add myself to the competition pretty easily hopefully let's see how bad the demo effect is going to be uh, and um, so the instructions are basically in the repo, but what I can do is actually I can run a simple DAML script that is going to um, add this new party that I just enabled on my local node, and it's going to enter it into the competition. And what we also have is we have a node in the Google Cloud that's sitting here, and that has an automation to accept um, entries into the competition. So if I try to, oh, if I try to run this, uh, okay. Ah, sorry. Okay. Uh, no effect. So damn demo effect. Okay, anyways, there is a leaderboard that you can um, actually, you can get to, and uh, you can look at the results. Actually, uh, we'll probably open the competition in something like an hour or two, because there are still some kinks that I need to work out. Uh, but yeah, hop on if you're interested in, in, in playing with DAML. And that is pretty much it. So um, these are the two things that we wanted to talk about. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for your fantastic talk, Simon and Ognian. Um, there was a lot of good discussion in the channel and a lot of questions were already answered there. Um, but let me highlight a few uh, popular ones so that we can also answer them on the recording. Um, so first question was how demo data types compare to other kind of um, similar um, message formatting protocols like JSON schemas, type defs, uh, protocol buffers, and thrift. And in particular, does um, do demo data types um, support recursive uh, data types such as trees uh, and things like that? Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, demo data types do support uh, recursive data types. So that that's one of the differences. Um, it, it depends on. I mean, it is it is another uh, data schema for for for, for data. Uh, it's one which we know very well, and the reason why we wanted to choose uh, this one is because we wanted to have uh, an easy tie to the language for the store procedures. So that that really was sort of essentially a, a joint decision. Otherwise, it might have made sense to go for a more um, established one. Yes. Um, then another. Question, good question, I think, is is if um, does every kind of um, participant who some, somehow participates in all these transactions, for example, the t-shirt vendor and Zurich Friends of Haskell, do they all need to host their own nodes for, for them to be able to, to work with these, uh, these contracts? So I can answer that maybe. Um, they need to host, they need to have access to a node. Uh, they have a choice. They can either host the node themselves or they can have, host, have somebody host the node for them. I mean, this can be a cloud provider or you can have a shared node where you can have many parties that are actually shared, uh, that share the same um, node, so same physical 
node. So this is really a choice that you have to make when you're deploying your application. If you want to, for instance, if you have requirements such as data localization, then you might really want to control where you're storing the node physically. Otherwise, you might just store it on something like Project Dabble, for instance, that we have that is happy to um, actually run a node for you. Or you can share it with, with other participants and parties. Yeah, I think this, this highlights an important uh, point that when, when you go for sort of these uh, distributed ledger solutions, then one of the things to always look at is like, what, what are your trust assumptions? Like how, how much shared trust do you have? And, and it's very interesting for people that are actually not in the financial industry to, to look at how that has been solved in the past. If you look at something like the Swiss Interbank Exchange, then there the banks came together, founded a legal entity, which they jointly own, to actually provide a legal entity that can provide the one marketplace to use to trade securities in Switzerland and to manage their registration. So, so there we have actually a centralized DB vendor, or actually a provider of a centralized database, and uh, the common business and legal constructions were used to make this trust warranted. So with something like this world database, you get into a place where you might actually be able to um, have such shared trust with way less effort. I mean, founding a legal entity for every marketplace, that means the marketplace really needs to be worth it. So I'm really curious what new kind of transactions come up and uh, if, if such technology becomes more widespread. Thank you. Another question is, is if um, there is a way to do migrations or updates to data models that have been specified in demo? Happy to take that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that's actually a really interesting question, because as as you've seen, like we we do content addressing uh, for both types um, and and values. Actually, the the rows that are stored, their data schema is fixed. As with that data schema, what is also fixed is all the stored procedures associated. So upgrading actually means that you deploy a new workflow, which is an upgrade workflow, where the owners of the data need to agree on, on sort of how the upgrade should work. And there also they get this control that if you add a new field, what the default value there is, it, it actually matters. If that field is sort of, um, well, let's say currency, it matters whether you're denominated in US dollars or in some much weaker currency. So that's that's where DAML actually, it really highlights a fundamental complexity in multi-party processes that um, once you agreed on data and that data is replicated, you really need to also agree on, on changes to that data and upgrades um, explicitly. And you can do that using the very same mechanisms that you already have to manage contractual workflows. Uh, maybe one final question. Um, what about if you're not working on a distributed application, but you have like a fairly simple application with only one node, are there then still benefits that you would get from using a database like this? Um, yes, I mean, it, it does depend on, on what application you're on. I, this is not a panacea, um, but what it does allow you to do really is, is to get a, a very solid handle on, on the process of, of how data changes. So you, instead of just having a data schema on its own, you also see like the full evolution of, of the data and the iteration you loop actually loop that you get on interacting on, on like when, when specifying this data model together likely with your product owner or the, the business expert, um, that can be much lower than in, in other approaches, but really depends on the team and how you're set up. Uh, so please try it out. If, if you're sort of heavy on, on workflow, then yes. If you are implementing um, another WordPress, then perhaps not. So maybe um, just to chime in, so one potential advantage that you could get is are, are these built-in notion of authorization and ownership? So you have something, you know, if you have to share your data between different users and you're worried about things like privacy, it might be something to look at. But do bear in mind that we have these um, trade-offs between expressiveness and privacy that, that Simon also talked about at length, such that some things will become a little bit more painful than if you're just running a regular web framework, for instance. I guess one, one other take on this is if, if you want, it, it definitely makes sense to use sort of a single node. I mean, there's 
the, the SDK itself comes with, with a full node on which you can run all these workflows and, and it's fully local. Um, you, you might want to use that if, if you say, well, I want to be prepared actually for going for a distributed solution. I, I see sort of this evolution path for my kind of business case. Uh, then that makes makes a lot of sense. But yes, as Ogmian said, it is not a full-fledged database. Like some queries, we, we know, like if you look at that transition from SQL databases to NoSQL, there again, this trade-off comes in that NoSQL scales better, but at the cost of, in some cases, consistency, in other cases, queryability. It's the same here. Okay, thank you again for the talk and for answering uh, all the questions. Um, so tonight we have another talk about effects systems by Alexis King. So I hope to see everyone again for that. Um, before that, there's lots of things to do. So you can hack on the contract for t-shirts projects, of course. We have a beginner track and an advanced track this afternoon. And there's also the mob programming sessions. Um, so join our Discord if you want to participate in any of these. And have fun today.